Dr. Graham Hill is a criminologist and former senior investigating officer with the Surrey Police. During his career, Graham worked to solve some of the UK's most high-profile and infamous crimes, including the murder of Millie Dowler and the London night stalker Delroy Grant. Someone has to be in charge. Someone has to bring the investigation towards its ultimate conclusion. Graham, who specialises in child abduction and murder, assisted the Portuguese police in the investigation into the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. In this series, he's using his own insider knowledge and expertise to unpack the investigation from the inside out. The public only ever sees the tip of the iceberg. I want to tell the full story and reveal how detectives brought a series of elusive killers to justice. This is Murder Detective. Ashted, located in Surrey's so-called stockbroker belt. It's about halfway between Leatherhead and Epsom, and in a county which is in the top five safest in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Ashted is a very affluent part of Surrey. You call it a leafy suburbs, which is about right. People with a few quid in their pocket could afford to live there. It was a very, very nice area, very quiet, quite a tight-knit community around there in that particular area of Ashton. It's a beautiful Surrey countryside, exactly like you see on the telly, where you go, oh, I'd like to live there. It's lovely and green, really nice houses. We moved into Harriet's Lane in 1971, and Sharon came, I think, about 1978, in the bungalow just across the road from us. So it was a very friendly place, lovely, lovely place to be. On December the 7th, 2007, Sharon Birchwood, a 52-year-old woman, was found murdered in her home. I've been reading a lot about the murder of Sharon Bertrand and it's really interesting because the investigation team were faced with a number of challenges from the beginning. So I'm on my way to see Maria Woodall, who's a retired detective from Surrey Police. At the time that she led the murder investigation into the death of Sharon Bertrand, she was the detective chief inspector. OK, so here we are in Harriet's Lane in Ashted. Can you tell me what it was like when you got called here in December 2007? Well, when I first got here, the area was already just secure. Uniform teams had arrived, they secured the area for me. I always like to go into the, the house. I need to feel what it's like, I need to see that person's life. So I want to get a feeling, I want to direct people in that house, tell the forensic officers what I want them to look at, tell the photographer what I want them to photograph. So as your brain starts to race, the adrenaline's pumping, you know you've got to get there, take control and start thinking about where you're going to go with the investigation. Now often I say that to establish how someone died, it's always useful to establish how they lived. What could you find out about Sharon and the way she lived her life? Well, very, very quickly we realised that Sharon lived on her own, um, that she, on face value, seemed like quite a lonely person. Her life was very insular. She had quite a lot of time spent with her family, her sisters and her mum. She was larger than life. She was the centre of attention the minute she walked in a room. She was very flamboyant. She always had everything matching. So if she was wearing blue, for instance, she'd have blue eye shadow, blue shoes, blue handbag, everything would go together. Oh, my word, was she flamboyant. Yes, yes, lovely. There was the silver wedding when she went with totally top to tail in her silver outfit, shoes, bag, dress, earrings everything and uh, she laughed because she said when her brother saw he said have you come dressed for the oven Sharon because she looked as if she was wrapped in tin foil so she had a great um, yes a great sense of humor and she once said to us well if I went into a room for a thousand pe with a thousand people sure enough they'd know I'd arrived because she was she was loud but in a lovely way Sharon used what we call 
a shooting stick, but it is actually a little seat. So it looks like a walking stick, but then it can come out into a little seat. And Sharon was well known around the village for having her shooting stick and her little seat. And yeah, she, was, she did have ME, so suffered with a lot of fatigue and tiredness. On the 7th of December, 2007, police received a call from Sharon's ex-husband, George. But when I went into the house, it didn't appear that it had been a burglary. There were a few kitchen cupboards that had been left open, but the back door was locked from the inside. There was no shattered wood around any of the locks, and the front door also had been locked because George had gone in through that way with his key. So the way I managed to verify that it hadn't been a burglary was to ask her family to go and look at the house some time later to tell me whether or not they knew anything had been stolen. Was it a burglary at that point? I didn't think it had been. I know that Sharon never let anybody in her house. So unless somebody had a key, if she didn't know it was or she wasn't expecting anybody, she would not have opened the door. So whoever got in there must have had a key. Well, for me, it was really key around the forensic strategy because I knew quite quickly that Sharon had been dead for a few days, possibly. So when I got into the bedroom, there were clothes and duvets and blankets piled high on top of Sharon. So we began to peel back layer after layer with the forensic teams. And then we discovered that she had actually been bound hands and feet and her hands had been pulled up towards her face and sort of bound with duct tape. And also there was a cord around her neck, is that correct? Yeah, it was an electrical cable, one you'd buy at B&Q, quite standard, but yes, that had been wound around Sharon's neck. The forensic team would have been there collecting fingerprints, anything that looked quite significant in the actual process of murdering Sharon. So all that would have been collected up by the forensic team, it would have been bagged up, and it would have been sent to the lab for testing. In those first 24 hours after Sharon's body was discovered, what sort of things were you thinking about and what sort of decisions were you making? Initially, you're looking for the suspect. That's your key driver. So how do you identify a suspect? You need to find out as much as you can about Sharon. You need to find out where she was, what she was doing, who she was talking to in those moments before she was murdered. So I have to eliminate all those people that she knew first at the same time as looking for a potential stranger. And where do you start on that? I mean, it's a bit of a needle in a haystack, isn't it? Where does that suspect information come from? And it comes from her life. Her ex-husband had actually called the murder in. He'd found her dead. So he was key in this investigation because although he was the ex-husband, they'd been divorced for many, many years. So he knew a lot about her life. So I was very interested in talking to him to find out if I could piece together who may have wanted to kill her. George was a businessman, um, or he called himself a businessman. I think probably a failed businessman would be the, the right way to describe him. Um, he was an unusual character, um, a, a rather strange man. I couldn't understand how the two had got together because Sharon was outgoing and open, and he was not. I don't think he ever spoke to me. He would sometimes be there, and he would always look past me. He didn't give you eye contact, as if I, never, I didn't count for him, basically. He did give me the shivers, and, he, and I think everybody else the same. She never told any member of the family except myself that she was divorced. And this charade was that he would turn up at birthdays or any celebration, he would turn up as if they were still married. So the whole family just assumed that they were still married. He had a second wife. He already had children with the other woman before he divorced Sharon. Um, and then he did marry the second woman. They've been divorced 20 years. How did nobody know that he had this other family and he's got children, like these poor children, what are they going through? And it was so surreal. She was besotted, I would say, rather than just in love. She was totally and utterly besotted with him. She couldn't imagine her life without him at all. And it broke her heart when they did get divorced. What do you think of the relationship? What was your first impression? 
You never assume or judge anything. Having been a police officer for many, many years, nothing really surprises you and you never make any snap judgments. It was unusual um, when you think about most marriages that they had stayed in touch and stayed that close. But he certainly was a form of information for us about Sharon's life. I'm guessing that at some point you started to think about wider long-term policies. Could you give us an idea of what you were thinking at the time? Well, we had to do quite a lot of house to house because it was a quiet lane and I very quickly became aware that there were a lot of people working on a house across the road in that area, so house to house and identifying everybody was quite key. We really needed to know who had been in that house as well because we knew the murderer had. So I needed to take fingerprints and establish everybody that had been into that house. So it's a really dynamic situation. You've got your teams on the ground doing the here and now, but it's your job to think about the strategy from getting you from that murder scene to a successful court conviction. For DCI Maria Woodall and the homicide team, the next step was an autopsy of the victim the results of which were to provide crucial and unexpected evidence in the murder of Sharon Birchwood. Criminologist and former detective chief superintendent Dr Graham Hill is in Surrey to find out more about the 2007 murder of Sharon Birchwood whose body was found in her home in the village of Ashted in December of that year. Graham has received insider access to the investigating team and already his own experience has established just what an uphill battle the detectives in Surrey were facing from the start. So a few hours into the investigation, the murder investigation team didn't really have anything. It appeared to be a random murder without any motive. On the face of it, the ex-husband was friendly and helpful. The woman had no enemies. Nobody seemed to know why anyone would want to kill Sharon Birchwood. Detective Chief Inspector Maria Woodall had to first establish a time of death for Sharon. The forensic pathologist examines the body in situ and then the body is taken to the mortuary, is that correct? Yeah, we take Sharon to the mortuary so that we can do a full forensic strategy around her so that we can discover any evidence. The cause of death for Sharon was by asphyxiation, by strangulation. But interestingly, when we were doing the post-mortem, we found a stamp that Sharon had clasped into her hand. And that stamp came from an envelope. It was a Christmas card from her mother. And that had actually been delivered on the 4th of December. So again, we're looking at the timeline. We're looking at Sharon's actual last time that she was alive. It was a Christmas card from my mum that arrived on that actual day, the 4th of December. So what a lovely thing for her to see before the horror of what happened next. We recovered her diary probably in the first week after her death. And then we could see the entries that she had in that diary. And she had a tendency to tick things off if she'd actually done them. And that day, the 4th of December, she was going to the farmer's market in Guildford. The last sighting they had of her was that she'd got off the train at Guildford station. I had to go through the CCTV with the police um, and verify that it was actually her. They tracked Sharon basically at the railway station when she arrived at Guildford, when she went into town, went into a particular shop, then basically coming back again, getting on the train and then making her way back. And then she was seen um, getting off the bus, if I remember rightly, not far from home, because it wasn't far from her, from her home address. What she was wearing was quite significant as well because what she was lying in bed wearing was the same clothing that we saw her on the CCTV in Guildford. So that was another aspect that gave us the fact that it was probably the 4th of December that she was killed. The forensics team quickly established and reported back on a crucial piece of evidence. When she was examined at the mortuary, the tape that was binding her feet and her hands was removed 
and sealed into exhibit bags for forensic examination. Also, when they searched the premises, they seized a number of items, and in amongst those items were the actual rolls of duct tape that were used to bind her feet and hands. Now, that roll of tape is the actual exhibit from which they obtained a DNA profile. The significant thing about the DNA on the duct tape was that the DNA would have been on the inside of the tape as the person wound it around. Whoever's been doing that got to the end and tore the end. Now, that end was on the inside of the roll, so it could only have been the killer's DNA. Maria and her team brought in Sharon's ex-husband, George Birchwood, in for an interview to try and find out who would want to kill Sharon. He was close to Sharon and could share vital information on her life and possibly last known movements. It was quite, I found it quite horrific. So there's lots of things you've got to consider at this point and I'm guessing one of them is also the interview of George, the ex-husband who called the police on the three nines call. What was happening with him at that time? At that time, I designated him as a significant witness. Um, he had known Sharon for many, many years, so he was going to be key into finding out aspects of Sharon's life that would help us identify a suspect. Is there anything else that you can think of that you think might be useful for us to know? George's initial presentation when he was spoken to by police, he appeared to be quite traumatised by what he'd seen uh, in the house. But he very quickly regained his composure. We had to be careful to um, not uh, kind of, you know, jump to conclusions from George's behaviour because it could have just been due to the fact that he was upset, he was traumatised. His ex-wife, he just found uh, deceased. So, yeah, we, we couldn't read too much into that. You were it was a long, drawn-out process. It didn't just happen over a couple of hours. It was over days, weeks, in fact. We had to build up the rapport with him and slowly but surely he started making mistakes. Let's have a look at some of those interviews and see what we can glean from them, yeah? Tell me everything that you can about what you remember. I entered the property, no problems. I walked into her room and then... Uh, and then discovered her in the bed. She was cold, very cold. So I just went straight out of the room and phoned 999. Uh, and waited for the, the ambulance people to arrive. And then the police. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. And um, I don't think you need me to say anything after that, do you? So what was the general impression that the interviewing officers got about George? I remember them saying that they felt that George wanted to control the interview. So he would talk freely in areas where he probably felt there was no danger to him. But when they started to probe, then you would see him change his behaviour. So they were picking up on his demeanour, his presentation yeah. style. Yeah. Um, in the interview world, that's often called tells, you know, where they start to show signs where they're under yeah. pressure and stuff like that. So let's watch a little bit more and see if we can um, see what he's doing here. Perhaps now's the, the right time to sort of give me an understanding of the relationship you've, you, you have with, with Sharon. How often you, you, were you visiting Sharon in recent weeks? Uh, four times a week. You've got, you've got it there. You see him move his hand. So, yeah, you see him sort of change his body language significantly when he starts to be put under a little bit of pressure, when he starts to be squeezed a little bit. That's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I walked over the road, wherever the light... He'd was. sit back if he was talking openly like this, chatting about, yes, if it was about, about the weather and everything else. And as soon as you pushed on a hard subject, it was like this, he'd look at you really hard, we'd look down and he'd just frown, and his whole face changed, because we knew, he knew that he was, well, we knew he was lying. You could sometimes actually see him thinking, maybe trying to remember what he'd already said, 
because I think with George, he gave us a mix of truth and lies. And when you have to start trying to remember your lies after hours and hours of interview, it starts to become really, really difficult. Maria and her team have begun to suspect George had a part to play in Sharon's murder. But they needed to establish a motive. Does she have any life insurance at all? Oh, yeah. Yes, she has. Yes, she's got life insurance okay. on that £62,000 mortgage. And do you know if you should have made a will? I believe there is a will in the house. OK. But, of course, a handwritten will like that, I don't know how legal it is. And what does it say? Everything's left to me. Everything's left to you. And do you help me out financially where you're at at the moment? Financially, I'm... Are you in debt? Oh, yeah, I'm always in debt. Well, that's me. To the tune of what? In total. Maybe approaching 100 grand. What do you think? Well, there you've got your motive, haven't you? I mean, he even knows the will is handwritten. There it is. So, once you've got this bit of key information, how does it change your thinking about this investigation? It makes George more of an interest to me, but at that point, I still didn't feel I had enough to make him a suspect. So I was making decisions to try and get as much information out of him, taking risk decisions around that, because if I made the wrong decision at any point during his interviews, then some of that evidence could have been barred from a, a future court case. So I could undermine the court case by my own decisions. It was crucial for Maria to establish where George was at the time of Sharon's death. You've got this key bit of information. What do you start to do to sort of build on this? What is your next, next move? Again, we would be looking at George's life, so we would be asking where he was at the time that we believed that Sharon was killed. One of the things that George dripped into the interview, that he was in a shopping centre for the time that we believed that Sharon was murdered. So we went to the shopping centre, we seized all the CCTV, and then we started to view it for George to see when he was there, what he was doing, and whether or not he was telling us the truth at that point. When we viewed the CCTV, it seemed apparent that he was always in view of the cameras. He rarely went into a shop, didn't seem to buy anything. And it did seem slightly strange behaviour. It didn't seem the normal shopping experience you'd expect. But an unexpected twist would soon stop the investigation team in their tracks. So your thinking is the DNA profile is the killer's? Yes. And your school of thought is potentially the killer could be George? Potentially. Yeah. How did you feel when the profile came back and it wasn't George? A bit deflated. I think the whole team were a bit deflated. How did you motivate them to carry on with the investigation? We, as we always do, we brief, we sort of refocus. Um, we still felt that George was a key um, because of the way he was behaving at that time, and he was giving us a lot of useful information. And again, drip-feeding us, so we knew he was a key. Now they had the situation where they had an unknown DNA profile, potentially of the killer of Sharon Birchwood, and they had George, who on the face of it, appeared to have a watertight alibi. You almost feel like you're back to square one, because it's not the man you've started to suspect. So you start to look at other areas, start to look a bit broader. I mean, it didn't rule George out, um, but it meant that, you know, he wasn't the man that actually did the crime himself. And he thought, well, this can't be right. He's involved, there's no question of that. But the proof wasn't there, there was no evidence there. So it was a bit of a downtime, I think, with the team. We were thinking, well, we've got to start looking for somebody else. DNA profile recovered from the crime scene of 52-year-old Surrey housewife Sharon Birchwood's murder was not a match for Sharon's ex-husband, George Birchwood. DCI Maria Woodall must search for another suspect. So this is a difficult point in the investigation for you and your investigation team. You've got a DNA profile that's been searched on a national database. You haven't got a hit and you've got George who's saying, actually, I was shopping in Epsom on the day that you think his wife was killed. 
the uh, analysis of his phone gave you some more significant information, didn't it? Yeah, and one of the strategies I had running at the time was to identify people that had been into that house. So he was helping me with that. So we were looking at his phone traffic and asking him who this number relates to. So he was going through those numbers and then he started to tell us who the numbers referred to. Right, so you use that motor road of incoming calls. That is basically my mobile phone. And it's used for incoming and outgoing calls. 56049. Right, recently I've had two friends here from Thailand. Okay. Could be one of those. So who are the friends from Thailand? One's called Paul. Paul, and what's his other name? George didn't have a lot of information about Paul. He said it was a, a man that he knew that had come across from Thailand. But he didn't know his surname. He was trying to evade and giving information around the questions that the officers were asking him. So again, for me, that was of significant interest. Who was this Paul? There was some quite unusual call patterns taking place before Sharon's death and that raised some suspicion. The number that was ringing George uh, and that George was ringing on his phone was a pay-as-you-go phone and uh, there was no activity on that phone after Sharon Birchwood's death. On the 4th of December, Paul sent George a text message and it said, what am I, a mushroom standing here in the dark? Our investigations showed that Sharon was actually late home. The train that she was going to catch, she missed, and she'd phoned George to say that she'd missed her train. So she was late. So I believe that Paul was there waiting for her in the house, in the dark, with the lights off, and he didn't know what was going on because Sharon should have been home and wasn't, so he texted George. Despite what appeared as a watertight alibi, Maria and her team still suspected that Sharon's ex-husband, George, could lead them to an answer. The thing you find with lots of people that are trying to hide information from the police is the longer they talk, the more they leak information. And that was Maria and the investigation team's strategy, was to get George to continue giving information as a significant witness in this case. These interviews didn't just happened over days, it happened over weeks. And we would take him home to his mother's place where he was staying because he didn't have any transport. And then we'd take him back to the suite where we'd interview him again. I took him back into his house with his mother to say hello to his mum because I got to know her quite well, as you can appreciate. She said, oh, how, how are you getting on? How did you get on today, George? He said, oh, yeah, it's all right, mother. We were just talking about um, this bits and pieces and, you know, my friend and everything. And then she suddenly said, Oh, your friend that I met at the railway station. And he went, no, 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 not that. You're getting confused, mother. You're getting confused. And I then said, Mr. Bertrand, what, what exactly, um, if, what was all that about then? She goes, oh, yeah, the, 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 the man from, um, from Thailand or somewhere, he came over to stay um, and I met him at the railway station. I brought him here. And I went, oh, OK, well, that's very nice of you. Oh, we let him stay and he stayed in the spare room. I said, it's really nice of you, Mr. Birchwood. That's very kind. And George is absolutely, you can see on his face that something had gone drastically wrong. The investigators used this information to finally put a face to Paul's name. I think we just looked at the most obvious station where he would have gone to because the home address, his mum's home address was in Banstead. So he checked the CCTV around about the time that George had indicated he would have arrived. And sure enough, you know, we found a very good picture of Paul um, shaking hands with his mother at the top of the stairs. She even tries to help him with his cases. She meets him there and there he is, bang, straight on the camera. It was fantastic. It was just like, Unbelievable how that, 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 that came about. Detectives pressed George on his connection to Paul, the mysterious visitor from Thailand. He's, he's actually a friend of a friend, really, isn't he? And is he, is he Thai or is he English? He's English. Or he's English. And how long did he stay? Two weeks, ten days. And where, where did he stay? He stayed in London, he stayed with me, he stayed... Whereabouts would he stay with you? Well, at my mother's. 
So you start to make some inquiries around this unknown Paul. Yeah. Um, what do you find out? Well, George also told us that he'd actually taken Paul to visit Sharon at Sharon's house. One of my key lines of inquiry was to identify everybody that had been in that house a few days or so before Sharon was murdered. So that meant that I needed to get Paul's DNA because I still had the DNA on the tape. So did that impact on any of your strategies? Yeah, I then included Mum's house, George's mother's house, because George told us that Paul had stayed there for a few days. So I asked George's permission to extend the forensic strategy into that house. When they searched that premises, they find in a bathroom a glass. On the rim of that glass, they find DNA material that when it's examined, matches the DNA profile found on the roll of tape in Sharon's home. There was also a fingerprint on the same glass, and when we ran that through the National Police Database, it gave us the name of Paul Crine. He had a previous conviction for robbing about £10,000 from Barclays Bank back in 1972. Paul was 23 when he committed that offence, and I think it was about that time that he left the UK and went to live in Thailand. That was a high point in the investigation, you know, when you've actually identified somebody. It, it, you know, it wasn't... The case wasn't done, but it was, uh, you know, it was a big step. Maria and her team worked to establish a line of communication between Paul Crine and George. We did a lot of searching around George's devices as soon as we began to get suspicious of him. And we found an email that he'd actually sent to Paul Crine where he had used Paul Crine's name. That's the email which was actually George offering Paul Crine a job in the UK, I think as a security consultant or something like that. When he, that was shown to him, it just completely, like, don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, that's, that's, that's from your, your computer. That's your address. He clearly knew exactly who he was. You know, he's a friend of yours from, from Thailand. But, again, he wouldn't, um, wouldn't, wouldn't have that. So, at this point, what are you and the investigation team thinking? Well, here we've got a man, Paul Crime. He's got previous convictions for robbery, so you would assume he was capable of violence if he had a conviction such as that. And he was in and out of the UK very quickly. So what happened to Crine um, after the murder? What do you think uh, was his movements and where did he go? We found images of him at Heathrow Airport that very same evening that we say that Sharon was killed. So he gets to Heathrow about eight, nine o'clock in the evening, and then he walks around Heathrow all night and waits for his flight the following morning on the 5th. So you're now in this position where you've got George still as a significant witness. Yeah. You've got a suspect who you think is the killer, who you think has gone back to Thailand. Yeah. What are you going to do when you find this person in Thailand? What's your plan? The plan would be to extradite him back to the UK to stand trial. Now, to be able to do that, we have to have a case that is ready for charge. So you have to have all your evidence. Um, we would not be able to interview him, so we would have to piece that together. And we would then have to bring him back into the UK under an extradition. One of the things that was a challenge was that Maria and her, the investigation team had to coordinate activity in Surrey and activity in Thailand 6,000 miles away and that's quite a complex process because there's lots of liaison to do with the Home Office, the Foreign Office, there's lots of liaison to do with the British Consulate in Thailand so it's a process that is sometimes very long, very drawn out and can be very frustrating. How did you start to build that evidence in Thailand? What did you do? One of the key things was to show that the DNA that we had collected from the tape and the glass was actually Paul Crimes. So I sent a team over to Thailand to do a covert recovery of Paul Crimes' DNA. We set up a meeting via some of our contacts in the British Embassy 
because Paul had been involved in criminality in Thailand. So the embassy staff were already aware of him and already had been talking to him previously. So it was quite seamless and it wasn't unusual for those staff to arrange to meet him. The arrangement was made to meet him in a restaurant. Someone from the British consulate sat and spoke to him. And when he left that meeting, the police officers were able to seize the cutlery and the food that he'd been eating. My team were there and they took the cutlery and the crockery and sent it back to me, forensically sealed, and I then had it couriered up to the laboratories and then they then did the DNA tests to compare it to the DNA that was found on the glass and also on the murder tape that was used to bind Sharon. The result was that the DNA material found on the cutlery used by Paul Crine was a forensic match with the DNA found on the tape and found on the glass. DCI Maria Woodall had narrowed in on Paul Crine, who she believes murdered Sharon Birchwood in her home at Ashted. Her team has gathered enough evidence to extradite Crine back to the UK. What's really important to understand is the DNA found on the tape recovered from Sharon's home and the DNA found on the glass at George's mother's house and the DNA taken from the cutlery in Thailand they are just an indication that it is Paul Crine who is the killer. Only when he arrives back in the UK can the police take an evidential sample of his DNA. The evidential sample has to be taken under controlled conditions in the UK, because otherwise the argument could be, well, that's contaminated, that someone else used that cutlery and it's not that person. And that evidential sample of DNA that is taken when he arrives back in the UK is the evidential sample that is used in court to prove that the man who left that DNA was Paul Crine, not the sample that's taken from the cutlery in Thailand. With DNA evidence linking Paul Crine to the murder, Maria and her team focused the investigation back on Sharon's ex-husband, George Birchwood. So Maria, let's talk through what happened. You identify Crine by DNA yeah. in Thailand yeah. and you get everything ready for the extradition yeah. and in the meantime what does that do to uh, George Birchwood's status in the investigation? As soon as we had the confirmation of the DNA from Thailand to the tape to crime, Birchwood became a suspect and he was arrested. George's trial got underway in 2009. As far as the team was concerned, there was no worries. It was just the complexity of it all. Any case you, you bring to a court, especially a complicated case like this, you do get a bit jittery, but um, I think most of us were confident that we'd get a conviction. All I remember is him standing there quite nonchalantly. He didn't appear to be stressed at all. I can remember just kind of staring at him because I was quite fascinated by how can you look that calm when you're up on a murder charge? George got 32 years. At that time, 32 years was one of the highest that Surrey Police had had of a conviction for a life imprisonment, which I thought was pretty good. It was a wonderful moment. I was staying in Essex with a friend. She had a bottle of champagne ready. I just picked her up off the floor and flung her around the room. And we had the champagne that evening, and it was just incredible. It was just such a relief to let go completely. I gave evidence at George's trial, but not at Paul's. And why were you asked to give evidence at George's trial? Well, I believe that George never took responsibility for his part in that murder, and that he thought that because he didn't actually murder her, he wasn't responsible for that murder. So he tried with his defense to undermine the credibility of the decisions that I took and the investigation that myself and the team ran. 
And your policy file came in useful at that point? Absolutely, because it justified all the decisions that I took, especially around him, but also in looking at other possibilities, other people that could have murdered Sharon, who were they? There were builders that worked across the road. There were at least 73 builders. So I interviewed and took DNA and fingerprints from every one of those builders to eliminate them from the investigation. Delayed due to his extradition, Paul Crine's trial began in 2010. I did know that George was not the sort of person that would have done the dirty work himself. He would have always got someone else to do it. So as far as I was concerned, the other person was the gun rather than anything else. George was definitely pulling the trigger and this guy was just doing something that he was being paid for. And it was obviously something that didn't bother him because he was had been in prison in Thailand for shooting somebody, so it was obviously just what he did. Both men were serving life in prison. But is it enough for the family to get closure? I think of Sharon, and I do, because obviously we see Lauren quite a bit, and she's very similar with her laugh and song with Sharon, and I just think about why did Sharon have to have a life that ended like this? It never gets better because I can spend hours with her. The last time I saw her, I went up there, I was up with her, we were with her all day, and then I get home and we're on the phone for three hours. So no, I won't ever, ever stop missing her. Nobody ever gets over it. And my nan never got over it. For me, it gets easier. I can have nice memories of her and think of all the nice things she did. But for my nan, no, my nan never got over it. Never, ever. My professional judgment is that this investigation was extremely well run, that the strategies that were used by the senior investigating officer to maintain the direction of the investigation were very good. And ultimately, it led to justice for Sharon Birchwood and her family, and it led to the conviction of two men that were ruthless and would do anything for money. I was privileged to work on this case because I was the senior investigating officer called on day one. So it meant that I held this case from beginning to end. I think the very early decisions in making sure that we secured the correct forensic items, that we did the thorough house to house, our lines of inquiry around eliminating everybody that had been in that house, those very early decisions played out extremely well when we eventually identified Paul and then were able to move on those lines of inquiry. I can't praise them up enough. They were amazing. The whole team that was involved in the case were just incredible. And without them, we wouldn't have got the conviction and we wouldn't have had them both banged up because it wasn't easy. It was a very complex, difficult case to, to crack and the amount of man hours must have been incredible that was needed to sort through everything. 